the truth of an experience lingers as consequence, just as creation testifies to God in spiritual union. To experience the divine, the most powerful spirit, is to be transformed by it. As the only observer, however, the question of identity arises with singular spirit. As soon as we identify anything, we have a duality, not singularity, because we cannot have yang without yin. Any identity will co-define its opposite automatically. Therefore, God, as the true singular spiritual being, has no identity. There is no one else to compare God with to say we need a name to make God distinct from any other person over there. There is no such other person. Spirit is singular by nature. There is only God. To be multiple, singular spirit must pass through the great distinction, the cosmos, and incarnate to reunite with God's Holy Spirit once again, as individuals who gain anointed companionship. In this manner, God's only definition is the cloud, and that has a multitude of names in contrast to nameless God, some of which are the elixir of immortality, the holy grail, the font of wisdom, the fountain of youth, the Philosopher's Stone, the Oracle, the All-Seeing Eye, the Third Eye, the Eye of Horus, the Eye of Ra, the Beard of Truth, the Bark of Ra, the Bark of Millions of Years, the Treasures of Heaven, the Waters of Life, the Face of God, the Throne of God, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Mountain of God, the Ark of the Covenant, yod heh or Jehovah, the Crown of Thorns, the Star of Bethlehem, the Star of David, Noah, Jesus Christ, the Golden Fleece, the Gordian Knot, the Bright and Morning Star, Apollo, Genie, Brahma, Merlin, Poimanders, which means shepherd of men. Truth never changes and guarantees that if anyone experiences its root and records it for others, it will always be the same eternal unchanging truth every time. As such, anyone who experiences it finds the same truth without fail and will instantly recognize it when spoken or written by another, even if buried under a mountain of allegory and curious metaphor. It cannot be hidden from us when we know from experience, no matter the philosophical depth. Jewish or Hebrew texts often record their enlightened education of the root condition in the form of allegorical stories or parables to instruct those who would read them on the nature of the reality they find themselves in, as well as the invisible world of metaphysics within and beyond. Jewish allegory is the nature of transmission in all messianic texts, like the books of Enoch, the Old and New Testaments, and the entire Gnostic corpus from Nag Hammadi and the Dead Sea. These allegories range from personifying natural issues like wind and water as gods born at the beginning of time that interact with humanity, called archons to the Gnostics, to the direct nature of personal salvation itself, as they should. The group of Gnostic texts known from the Nakamadi Library contain a curious gospel attributed to the Apostle Thomas, apparently a potential brother of Jesus. In fact, the name Thomas hides its meaning as twin, meaning Thomas is the twin of Jesus, but not in any normal sense. They are more like the brothers Tweedledum and Tweedledee from Alice's Wonderland. We must begin to recognise patterns when approaching ancient messianic texts such as these, and look beyond the idea of historical identity, fitting its characters into our sense of interpretation. 
It is only when we see the patterns and know the true nature of ascension that we become aware of the writer's theatrical intentions. The reader may recognise Tweedledee and Tweedledum as Jesus and Judas in the twin brother routine, where one is simply bad in some way and the other is good. For Thomas, the bad attitude is his doubting nature, akin to the lower thinking of not believing in God truly. If he has spent time with Jesus, surely Thomas has established already that he should have no further need for any doubt in the authenticity and authority of Jesus, particularly at the end of his story when he still doubts. By talking about brothers like Cain and Abel from Genesis, or doubting Thomas and the risen Jesus, the texts are recording information regarding the cloud as the most important creation there is, and how it forms the bridge between the two worlds of spirit and energy in its coded stories. Cain is the one who works the land, like the creator works with the element earth or material nature, and can only bring physical offerings to God's throne. Abel comes after Cain, as he should, and is the shepherd who keeps flocks of sheep that trust him as their guide. He is the ascended master or angel, the anointed one, who teaches those around them in the ways of truth and reality. The offerings of these masters in life is prayer, or high thought, and devotion, or inner peace. As the union of opposites, heaven in perfect balance has both qualities associated with its nature at once, and when personified in a method of allegory, becomes the devil and the son of God. The devil kicks off the universe with a great pulse of chaos that over time develops into neat orbiting systems that harbour life capable of uniting with the great Holy Spirit. Herein is the process from crudity to refinement personified by the key players in the stories as the bad and the good. Jesus is the purification of Judas or the devil in this sense and explains why in the Gospel of Judas these two twins or brothers are the ones who have a special relationship with each other. The only reason for this curiosity is that they literally represent the same cloud at either ends of the life process between them. What starts out as totally impersonal as the creator of the universe we are born into becomes totally personal as the cloud of heaven within. Our personal saviour afforded us by the grace of God. Since the observer is a representative of the cosmos, considered female, unifying with the Spirit of God in divine marriage makes the observer the virgin mother of the divine child, since no physical union has occurred to produce it. God as pure spirit, in contrast, is considered male simply because spirit impregnates matter. The reception of God's Holy Spirit becomes the embodiment of the Virgin Madonna nurturing her permanent newborn infant. If God is the patriarch of metaphysics, the great divine mother figure, whose womb is the abyss, is its matriarch, together attending their baby, the divine cloud. We, the observer, become privy and witness to this divine scene, commemorated in the Madonna and Child. As the dark creator persona, the titles for the cloud become more opposite-facing and darker in nature, but may be summed up by the simple devil persona. This dual nature is the price of unifying opposites to generate the eternal house of God, since the devil's evil nature is merely physical nature itself the opposite of spirit. Various Christian religious texts tell us that the way to heaven is guarded by a flaming sword. This simple metaphor conceals the keys to heaven. The flame refers to God's cold fire, the first key, when we become still in our minds and know God. The effect of this union is contemplation on the nature of God and oneness, uniting dual opposites in the process, the second key, opening the single narrow gate within and connecting with unity itself. This 
causes our ascension to the feet of the truth with flesh, the great sword of truth, Excalibur, symbolically speaking. In correspondence, the famous statement attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew concerning peace and the sword may be understood in the same way. If we are shallow in our interpretations concerning the content of the Gospels, we might conclude that Jesus is a warmonger when the statement is nothing more than an allegory for the concept of bringing truth to people's ears by speaking it. Combining the flame of the first key with the sword of the second obviously gives us a flaming sword guarding entry into heaven, God's house and holy church. We can easily recognise that Christian churches represent the house of God, Bethel in Hebrew, the cloud of heaven itself, whose exterior symbolises the human body as the temple in which God's Holy Spirit and Son manifest, and whose interior represents the brain and the internal experience of ascension to the cloud. When we first enter a church and immediately look across to the opposite wall, we see the crucified divine child, or Lamb of God, at the other end of the building, just as we see the cloud in the near distance when we encounter it in the abyss. The central aisle that leads towards the altar mimics his right arm stretching out towards us. Church halls are always accompanied by a tower to symbolise the union of opposites as male and female reproductive aspects, metaphorically associated with spiritual rebirth. A sexual allegory referring to the deeper union of the human with God's spirit that sees the birth of the Son of God. The body phallus concept goes back into antiquity as a story concerning the loss of the phallus in the lower region of the body associated with physical nature in contrast to the higher spiritual nature of contemplation that sees the ejaculation of the spirit from the body which becomes a spiritual phallus for this higher purpose. According to the book The Temple of Man by the author René A. Schwaller de Lubitz, the growth of an idealized human being is precisely encoded into the Temple of Luxor with the use of the golden section, the same proportion found throughout the natural world. However, Luxor Temple is not merely a representation of the mineral-based skeletal structure of a human in stone, but contains allegorical references to the function of the various organs and glands of the body in its various statues and wall carvings. As with all human temples, the Holy of Holies takes the position associated with the pineal centre of the brain, the place of transformation that sees a human become an angel when the physical function of the gland is transformed alchemically into its spiritual function. Among the churches and temples of the world, the one that most succinctly approaches the true act of squaring the circle as an archetype for spiritual transcendence, is the pyramid form. A pyramid is a philosophical and allegorical building primarily, not a practical one for living or gathering in. The base of a pyramid is naturally a perfect square, as the main architectural allegory for the squared circle whose centre must coincide and remain vertically true all the way up to the singular point at the top. Equivalently, if our evaluations are true in life, we build a mental picture of reality that should rise as a pyramid goes up straight and true, arriving at its destination in a single point of full understanding. As we live, we make comparisons with the information we gain from experience of the way things are and allegorically make bricks from clay. Arranging the accumulation of our bricks, each representing a filtered and established piece of information concerning objective reality. We turn our lead or base metal into gold in the crucible of our lives.
a mental pyramid of accumulated reliable knowledge that rises and guides us to the singular truth by logical induction and deduction and eventually divinely inspired philosophical extrapolation. If God has given us anything, it's a brain with which to think for ourselves. Pray for wisdom then, like Solomon, not arms. Prayer, as an activity, is not begging, but thinking constructively about truth that leads to wisdom. We become the embodiment of that truth when we understand it directly from God within. The truth of God and our body is all that we need to generate heaven. We have everything we need already then. All we must do now is understand the root unity of our existence from what is already made. This mental arrow in life is our guiding star, the way home to understanding and rest. In John 6.53 we read, quote, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Unquote. The Son of God is, of course, also the Son of Man, kind, since we, mankind, are those whose fault it is that such a cloud is produced when God expands from us in our ascension. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood is nothing more than a way of referring to the cloud and its beams in the head, feeding the illuminate with pure divine light. As a sign of eternal life in the illuminate, the statement goes on to explain that the cloud is like a cake that we can eat and still have, forever, as if the Son of Man is a never-ending food supply. A later passage in the Gospel of John, at 20.30, called The Purpose of the Gospel of John, appears to support the idea that a person 2,000 years ago is the one and only Son of God, and the only Messiah there has ever been or will ever be. Shame we all missed him. There is only one Jesus. This is true, semantically. The passage reads, quote, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. End quote. The only word in the sentence that is not English is the word Messiah, which is a Hebrew word. In English, this word is simply anoint with a variety of endings, depending on how we use it in a sentence. Anointing is an action that occurs to a person, not the person themselves, technically speaking. A person is anointed with something, receiving the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. The ones who become angels anointed with the Son of God, the personal cloud of heaven, if we substitute the appropriate English word where it should be in the sentence, it now reads correctly as, quote, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the anointing, the Son of God, and that by believing in truth, you may have life in his name, as an angel with his name written on your forehead. End quote. Now the sentence confirms correctly that Jesus Christ is God's anointing to his servants, the servants of truth, the ones who are honest with themselves and have his name written on their foreheads as the cloud itself. The cloud speaks for itself, 
but it needs us to write down what it has to say. When a person is anointed, they literally speak the word of God in the sense that the truth comes out of their mouths and through their written words. God is the answer to all the mysteries of existence as simply God. Logic dictates we will always find the underlying and invisible truth of anything when we simply look at what it is and what it does. In objective reality, distinct issues must coincide to form a continuous picture that makes verifiable sense overall, no matter how deep it goes. We only need look around in the natural world to see a multitude of patterns some of which transcend scale and size in their fractal-like repeating gnomic expansions, to see the potential for a unifying principle. Some of nature's patterns are not always obvious in any given moment, though, as they work across time. For instance, we all know that a tree and the seeds it produces are a testament to the original seed that created them, proving its nature and prior existence by reproduction. An acorn will always make more acorns in a cycle or loop pattern where one seed becomes many through a functional transition, like an oak tree. Relating the seed with the ground by planting it is the primary function or catalyst for their unification as the tree, which then becomes the function that turns the original seed into many more. The geometry of this process is a simple expansion of polygons that naturally starts with a single point, expanding into two, then three, adding points ad infinitum. As the number of points increases to infinity, the limit of the sequence becomes a circle with an infinite number of points as its circumference. In the process, the original discreteness has been sacrificed and turned into a continuous circle, leaving a potentially infinite hole that lacks a definitive center. Of course, defining the centre of a circle on paper is simply a matter of using a compass to make the centre in the first place. However, it's the infinite concept the circle represents that's important, since we are conceptually defining the centre of infinity itself, which naturally has no centre, being continuous, limitless, timeless, ineffable and undefined. The appropriate allegory and means to accomplish this task is known in geometry as squaring the circle. Once a square is defined, its centre is geometrically implied by crossing opposite corners. Crossing the square like this becomes the allegory to how we can use the physical world as the logical means to decode and understand the singular truth it's rooted in. Extrapolating to the infinite extremes of both the idea of a discrete point and its surrounding continuity gives a poignant singularity and an infinite expanse beyond measure as the greatest distinction they can have. The only difference between them as common singular entities at this extreme is that the circle distinctly highlights an undefined gaping hole. A circle can have any size, of course. The only distinction there can be then is between its discreteness and its continuity, a condition that's fulfilled philosophically and geometrically by the unit point and circle as either side of the zero-dimensional nature they represent. The point and circle are one and the same, from opposite extreme points of view at once. Any event or story that has a beginning, a middle, an end, squaring the circle is the philosophical archetype of the expansion of a point into a circle, the fullness of which completes the range of its own potential when reconnected back to its point of origin unifying discreteness and continuity again, defining the same three-act dramatic event as the seed-making process. We can take any point on the circumference and draw a circle from that point with the same radius and produce another circle interlocked with the first at their respective centres. This first geometric form is known as the vesica pisces, meaning fish bladder, 
due to the central portion resembling the bladder of a fish. The fish bladder form in the centre of the two circles can be encased perfectly in a double square whose side lengths we can take as unit value or simply one, giving a full height for the double square as two units. If we distinguish the upper portion of the full diagonal going through the double square from lower left to upper right with a comparative value of the square root of five and arc it down to the horizontal central line from the upper square, we find the growth proportion dubbed phi embedded and hiding in its fine structure, the very proportion of gnomic expansion found throughout energetic and living systems across the natural world. The vesica begins a process of self-replication that fulfills its range by completing a layer of circles around the original, forming the geometric seed of life as the completion of the implied nature of the squared circle. Expanding a third layer constitutes the action that finally reproduces the seed again many times over and makes the geometry of the flower of life, a hexagonal array filling all spatial potential in two dimensions only, suggesting a natural limit has been reached as we find in the three steps of the unit squared circle. If we want to apply this sequence to reality, we need to consider the dimensions of reality Expanding the same three-act sequence into two, three and four dimensions from the original zero-dimensional point, the squared circle, as the foundational two-dimensional unit becomes a sphere in three dimensions and a torus in four dimensions. When we include time as process, the torus is a figure detailing the seed-like relationship between discreteness as a whole and its continuity as its surrounding spherical form, otherwise known as a hypersphere, a sphere with a hole in it. The outermost is the innermost, as black holes are the outside of the cosmos that has no outside out there. All four dimensions of space and time are accounted for in this sequence, from the zero-dimensional point inside the curved one-dimensional line of the circle to the two-dimensional spherical surface, the three-dimensional volume and four-dimensional process of the torus. Each contains the basis of the next. The circle defines a surface, like the sphere, yet the sphere contains a volume akin to the torus, implied as the area within the original circle. In correspondence, the torus, as the third and final stage, is derived from both the squared circle and the square directly by joining opposite sides of the square that join seven points together in the unit to first form a tube and then a torus. The toroidal process is self-referential, akin to the seed-making process that reproduces itself and completes the table of expansion from a point using the unit squared circle process as the foundational principle. Like the handoff in a relay race, the tree cannot be made without the seed, and the new seed cannot be made without the tree. They each produce and rely on the other, with the aid of the outside world they exist in. A seed, in this sense, is the natural unit of its own life cycle. In discrete terms, the triangle sees the birth of the new seed within itself, as they appear in the branches of a tree forming a discrete tetrahedron as the four points of the complete life process. The ten-point tree of life, of Kabbalistic fame, is, in fact, the same natural philosophy as the Eastern yin-yang concept in Taoism, the symbol for unity, duality and balance, all together as one unit, laid out as a sequence of ten points when applied to the natural reproduction cycle. This overall sequence constitutes the classical tree of life, or plan of creative action, based on the natural relationship duality has with itself as unity. Discreteness relates to definition and objects with dimensions and boundaries, whereas continuity relates to process and transformation over time, as if taking an observational perspective of the real-world process from the top of life's mountain where we can see everything from start to finish in a single glance. The physics of life is always available in any moment. 
Metaphysics is beyond the level of the moment, as a process only visible across time. It allows us to see further than our immediate moment and predicts the nature of all relationships as an automatic process that leads, if continued, to unification, the very moment that starts the process off again as a new generation of seeds in application. In this way, the torus and its process models the three critical stages in the unfolding of any process as three points of transition or transformation corresponding with the squared circle archetype and the three-act drama format. Over the course of its process, the expanding and contracting tetrahedral frames share the central point as twin tetrahedra, tip to tip, defining the eight points of a cube when unified as a Merkaba. If we make a Merkaba of all eight tetrahedral corners in the original Merkaba, it gives 8 by 8, which is 64 tetrahedral corners in total, and defines the frame of a cube octahedron, the first platonic solid whose frame can invert through itself, like the torus. 64 grid tetrahedral formation is akin to the 64 squares on the chessboard, a game associated with the drama of human life, centred in the mind and its three phases of youth, middle age and old age, Arranging a formatted sequence of shapes defines a seven-stage process cycle of correspondence between discreteness and continuity. They hand off from one to the other in a relay. The basic double tetrahedra inside the cube octahedron becomes the central defining seed point of the squared circle infinity that starts the cycle. As such, the Merkaba is a defining seed that flowers into the cube octahedron through the cycles of discrete continuity. When the circle is squared overall in this geometric process that reproduces itself in the same expanding loop we find in the natural world of acorns and oak trees. Eggs cannot be unscrambled and put back in their shells. Just so, the cycle of accumulation that leads to the unification of seeds is comparable to the unidirectional flow of the arrow of time and reveals a definite cause and effect to events. Likewise, since an oak tree grows from an acorn, we can take the product of the metaphysical seed to be a tree that incorporates its properties, unified as the observer's natural learning environment. As the manifest opposite to its metaphysical seed, the resultant expanding space-time universe can be modelled with the same three-in-one metaphysical pattern in three dimensions of space and one imaginary dimension of time. Comparing the overall esoteric picture of reality with the discrete tree archetype reveals the four classical mystical worlds and an overall split between the upper and lower halves of the tree, representing the natural split between the upper and lower worlds of spirit and energy. The first level applies to the cosmic source or world of emanation, the infinite pulse, the true source of the light and its condition. The second relates to the world of creation and the completion of the metaphysical triad that includes the Son of God, the one that rings the cosmic bell from its leverage point at zero. Starting the lower half of the tree with a spherical distribution Instead of a discrete point defining a position, we can apply the next rate of change to the cosmic expansion, acceleration, and relate it to the world of formation, since the cosmos is mostly about energy, mass, and form. The only thing left to apply at the lowest level of the tree are the controlling brakes for the accelerating runaway train that is the cosmic expansion. A return to the zero of the seed condition but in purely energetic terms. At this level, black holes are worlds of action that constitute energetically produced seeds distributed across the branches of the cosmic tree like a giant cosmic spider's web spun by the great demiurge cosmic creator. Mapping the cosmic relationship onto the three-act drama places the metaphysical seed in Act 1 the cosmos as the tree that grows from it in Act 2, leaving Act 3 to predict the nature of a black hole, 
complete with singularity and event horizon, portrayed philosophically and geometrically as the unified extremes of a simple point and circle. The suggestion being that the third act represents the reunion of energy with the metaphysical source itself at T0, the same state as the event horizon of a black hole. In subsequently producing the basis of life that leads to the potential reproduction of the creative principle, black hole-centred galactic content makes its way back up the tree archetype, returning to the monad in the rationale of a person. Expanding out the four levels of the archetype with a return count back up to the origin produces a natural seven-stage cycle in which we can see a progression of biological systems rising in ever-increasing complexity toward the rational being who gains wisdom, or Sophia. The left side of the sequence is purely automatic and energetic, with the yin-yang relationship applied to positive and negative charges. In this application, the electromagnetic spectrum is a second identity, or kingdom, shown as a rainbow of waves in the graphic, implying the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Light is both packets and waves in its manifestation of discrete continuity. Finally, the fourth level shows the networking idea we find with black holes, but in this application as linking atoms comprising the mineral or molecular kingdom at the much smaller mass scale. The right side of the sequence represents the development of gender-driven living systems, more complex patterns that gain more and more physical freedom towards the great leverage point in mentalism. At this level, the nature of cause and effect becomes more pronounced in the life cycle process of plants. Gender-driven animal life then develops mentally to the point of high intellect as rational beings who can gain personal spiritual ascension, graduating out of the processing universe. At the platonic level of pure geometry, we can map the nature of the cosmic cycle using the simple continuity of dimension and discreteness already defined. The seven stages of natural manifestation inverts leverage from the original primal ether to the reverse in black holes, completing the return to the origin and energetically organizing cosmic material into stars and planets that birth rational creatures who ascend and establish the origin with the leverage of God's Holy Spirit. A tree is a testament to the seed that produced it. Therefore, by studying the plant and the seeds it produces, we can map the state of the original seed. If we know an oak tree makes acorns, we know that an acorn is where the tree came from. If the universe is one overall process, the alpha will be identical to the omega, unlike seeds that form distinct new generations over time. For the universe, its seed will be precisely what is generated in its branches or planets, focused poignantly on the mind of the rational observer, according to metaphysical logic. The appropriate conceptual condition, then, contains the seed, the ground it's planted in, and some water to germinate the seed. In this case, we know the contents of the T0 state and can easily assign the various characters to it. The abyss becomes the ground in which the observer, as the white light of Sophia, or wisdom, is planted as a seed of creation, metaphorically watered by the cloud in the near distance. Heaven is a cloud at the root of time that waters the seed of life. The natural geometry and process of reality is a testament to the unified philosophy behind it, a philosophy of natural shape and surface, discreteness and continuity, born from a singular source that contains the essence of both at once in a fundamental relationship. We can map this process as a simple metaphor onto a Mobius strip, created by joining two ends of a strip of paper with a half twist that makes the two surfaces of the paper into just one surface. The twist must be performed manually, of course, and suggests how the metaphor relates to personal ascension that comes from within objective life. A further look at the study of surfaces takes us from the Mobius strip to the Klein bottle, a single surface like the Mobius strip, 
but a closed, discrete, two-dimensional surface like the donut. The Klein bottle is made from a square, like the donut, but has a half twist in one of its connections, like the Mobius strip. When applied to natural philosophy, the Klein bottle level of geometry contains the same message of self-reference as the ancient tree of Yggdrasil. The tree is the process of self-knowledge, gained from objective nature. Physical reality challenges each one of us to see the truth as it is by its unchanging indifference. It must be set in stone as the physical world reflects or it would have no value whatsoever. It is physical life that allows us to become the leverage point of our own ascension into heaven, making this single event the most revered event in human history Blessed is the lion which becomes man, when consumed by man. Cursed is the man whom the lion consumes, and the lion becomes man. Saying 7, Gospel of Thomas. When we are made from it as creatures of the universe, the lion creator has become man first. The one who becomes strong as a lion in the divine, meaning an ascended person, is the one who consumes or tames it as their crown, making it their own heaven. Cursed is the man who reincarnates into the cloud's physical creation again, experiencing the second death in the process, otherwise known as reincarnation. The angelic name, Ariel, meaning the Lion of God in Hebrew, has also been used to refer to the Demiurge and is called his perfect name. Its name in the Gnostic library is Yaldabaoth, which means child of chaos or child passed through here. There are two more names associated with it, Samael, meaning blind God or God of the blind in Aramaic, and Saklas, meaning fool. He is mentioned in the Cosmos, Chaos and the Underworld as one of the twelve angels to come into being to rule over Chaos and the Underworld. He comes from heaven, his face flashed with fire and whose appearance was defiled with blood. The face flashed with fire is a clear reference to the self-luminous nature of the cloud alongside a clear analogy drawn between the cloud's body and that of a lamb covered in white wool but flashed with blood as a further analogy to being pierced 32 times, letting out its lifeblood as beams of light, or seraphim, the fiery serpents. The word archon means ruler. However, the nature of the word archon is more akin to the word authority. Yaldabaoth as the greatest manifest authority is the chief archon and yet is considered blind or ignorant of his own origins. One Gnostic mythos describes the declination of aspects of the divine into human form. Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom, the Demiurge's mother, a partial aspect of the divine pleroma or fullness, desire to create something apart from the divine totality without the receipt of divine assent. The desire to create something apart from divinity is a way of expressing how the cloud produced as a unification of both energy and the divine spirit will always have the physical quality associated with it and will subsequently perform in the same way, automatically. There is no personal desire in Sophia to create anything apart from the divine in fact. The automatic and energetic nature of the cloud becomes a devilish aspect referred to as Yaldabaoth, the creative monstrous demiurge, the one who has no self-control. 
The Demiurge, having received a portion of power from his mother, Sophia, sets about a work of creation in unconscious or automatic imitation of the superior pleromatic realm. He tries to mimic the infinite pulse of God's expansion and makes a copy of the spirit world. He frames the seven heavens, the seven spirits of God, hermetic principles and kingdoms, as well as all material and animal things, according to forms furnished by his mother, Sophia. Working however blindly, and ignorant even of the existence of the mother, who is the source of all his energy. He is blind or ignorant to all that is spiritual, but he is king over the other two provinces, the abyss and the cosmos. The word demiorgos properly describes his relation to the material. He is the father of that which is animal like himself, the physical issue. Thus, Sophia's power becomes enclosed within the material forms of humanity, themselves entrapped within the material universe. The goal of Gnostic movements was typically the awakening of this spark, which permitted a return by the subject to the superior, non-material realities, which were its primal source. To say Sophia becomes enclosed in the physical copy world creation of the cosmos, is to say God must enter the created beings to redeem the creation of his son as the creative cloud, akin to a parent having to clean up after their child. Physical life as our objective truth demands that we take the reins of a newborn beast through which we can interact with the cosmic world and all the other beasts that populate it, some of whom we can relate to and some we cannot. The process of growing up demands we face the pressures of our own transformation as our beast of a body becomes a developed adult full of the faculties of self-gratification, challenging us to meet their needs while developing beyond them. It is our primary spiritual nature that allows us to recognize the distinction between our raw eternal self-context and the automatic features and functions of the beast we ride and develop our awareness in the body to rise and meet our own true spiritual aware nature hidden beneath its covering. As a mere reproduction, the objective cosmic world sits in stark contrast to the spirit world, our true home, both revealing and hiding our true nature in its mimicry and distinction. Our spirit world, as the blueprint of the cosmic world, is like home in every way, but there is no looming death and the potential of falling out of balance through bad habits and mental health issues like in physical life. In the spirit world we find reception to our physical demise as souls when we go to the light in death and the continuation of our existence as individuals who use the physical experience of life as a means to advance ourselves to the point of making the ultimate home in our own personal spiritual space. Like a safety net, the abyss is our own infinite nature, otherwise known as the mental plane, which simply means it is our own selves as the naked observer without anything physical added to us. We are the discreteness of the continuous abyss, fundamentally. Both we and the abyss are spirit-natured, or ether, which refers to continuity, meaning never-ending but the abyss itself is simple continuity, like the circle, whereas we, the discrete observer, are the self-aware part. Together, we make a unit of discrete continuity, like the squared circle, the eternal abyss with an eternal point of view. As the mental plane, the abyss is our mind on the outside. What we think of will appear in front of us. Nothing about it is real as such. The imagination is certainly not objectively real. This means we can conjure all that we see and experience in its virtual world, or hollow deck, where we generate holograms of anything we like, even our dark inner content, the unprocessed issues we acquired from our physical incarnations, reflecting our state of ignorance. This is true. Our discreteness in a physical body, as a dressed, otherwise naked singularity, 
is merely our point of view and how our eternal empty nature will appear to the physical world around it. An awareness singularity, so to speak, with no size at all, clothed in something physical that allows us to interact with anything other than ourself, which is only ever physical. Without a body to dress ourselves in, we are but naked, infinite, self-aware, discrete points of eternity, lacking definition and identity, needing the vestment of a physical body to transform our spiritual state from the undefined, continuous, empty abyss of ignorance and darkness to expand into our fullness in light, definition and gnosis. From our natural position of being and having absolutely nothing, even while we live in the cosmos where we acquire wealth of its nature, we must endeavour to make something that lasts beyond it if we are to develop and stop going round in circles, life, death, life, death, etc. Life is a process that turns the original and primordial abyss with its ignorance and simplistic creator into the complex and robustly supreme Son of God our personal saviour and permanent home as angels. We must prove the truth to ourselves to be part of heaven. We can only reside in an eternal house we build with God. As the greatest issue, our transient lives are made for this single purpose. Without the change granted by life, we cannot generate a better spiritual condition. The ever-changing objective nature of physical life is but a school of development in this sense, where rules and consequences apply, teaching us how to use intelligence to eventually generate permanent heaven by mentally establishing unchanging truth to ourselves during life. Without it, we are stumbling around in a darkened room looking for the light switch that we are sure is on the wall somewhere, if we could just find it. With the light on, the entire room is illuminated. Just as standing on a mountain peak illuminates the entirety of the world below in a single glance, allowing us gnosis or true knowledge from clear sight or clairvoyance. The Gospel of Thomas allows us to see from such a height, using a variety of allegories in its sayings that define the various aspects of this and the other side of existence. Quote, Look for the living one while you are alive, so that you will not die and then seek to see him, and you will not be able to see him. Unquote. Saying 59, Gospel of Thomas. Look for the living one, the Son of God, while you are alive, because in death we are compared for reincarnation. If we are the spiritual accumulation of our endeavours, in death the only comparison to make with us is with the cloud that exists automatically. The judgment we all face in reckoning is nothing more than the comparison between us as the original infinite observer and the product of perfection, the cloud, as the unification of opposites at the pinnacle of truth. Meaning place of peace or place of silence Shambhala, in Sanskrit, is a mythical paradise spoken of in ancient texts. According to legend, it is a land where only the pure-hearted can live, meaning those who have achieved enlightenment. Accordingly, the mythical Buddhist kingdom of Shambhala is a place where love and wisdom reign and where people are immune to suffering, want or old age. If we make heaven during life, we can enter our new permanent home and find rest and bliss when our body fails us. If we do not make our own, we cannot see it and cannot enter it until we do. The solution is we need to build a strong house, one that will withstand the great loss of physical life. The story of the three pigs and the big bad wolf who blows down their houses and eats them is a story about making heaven or not. The big bad wolf is essentially the devil or the most physical persona that cannot see beyond its own remit or boundary. The wolf responds to physical necessity and a desire to eat, not an intellectual stance. 
Each of the three pigs uses their intellect to make a house out of different materials as a defence against the wolf's attack, an allegory for death. The first makes his out of straw bundles. The second makes his out of sticks and twigs. The third goes all the way and makes his out of bricks and mortar. When the big bad wolf comes around, the first two houses are swept away easily, but the third house stays standing strong because the material it was made from is durable, reliable and robust, like the truth with flesh. When the wolf cannot have his food, he climbs down the chimney and falls into a pot of boiling water, overcome by the intellect and wisdom of the third pig. Notice it's the third pig that outsmarts the devil. If the story went biblical, it would be on the third day. Three is a number synonymous with the nature of the singular metaphysical observer who ascends to the abyss, generating heaven in the process before they have physically died. Making a house from bricks begs the question, what kind of house are we really building? In other words, how do we build an eternal house and what does it look like? The only way we can do anything eternal is by consulting God, the fullness of the eternal observer and the only true reality there is. As such, ascension unifies the individual free will conscious with the automatic subconscious making the inner content of our psyche plain in the sight of God, allowing us true sight, or clairvoyance. We do this by turning our attention to study and learn about the automatic reality we are in, to as much depth as we can muster, until a single understanding comes through. It's up to us to respond to our minds with insight and action if need be. However, because we cannot control the outside reality, things go wrong all the time. Quote, the best laid plans oft come to naught. Unquote. We need to learn how to fail and lose gracefully in the sight of the eternal non-ego of spirit, as much as how to win and succeed, recognizing is but a play of gradients between two extremes. Without trying, we cannot make mistakes and learn from them, gaining experience, learning how to find the leverage point within that generates heaven. Therefore, it is not the mistakes that count, since mistakes are a necessary part of any learning experience. It's how we deal with them. This is the measure of our free will. The whole of creation is the process of transforming the indifferent devil creator by using his creation into the personal Son of God, wisdom and clear-sightedness with God's help. Together, we tidy the shelf by organizing that light back into its correct position at the center of all things, where it belongs. <laughs>